uh, looking around, we have many people here from many diverse backgrounds uh, doing many, many different things all, uh, you know, in your own way to try to think about our future and to try to think about energy and to try to think about community and whatnot. We are all here together. Um, uh, what we share is the need for us to figure out a future that nobody else is figuring out for us. Um, as you know, we're under assault in, on many sides and on many fronts, and it's exactly a diverse gathering like this that's necessary for us to chart uh, our future. And uh, we all have a very important play, part to play in this, and the fact that you're here is uh, a great uh, testament uh, to your thinking out beyond yourself thinking about uh, broad things and about the world that we live in and what we need to do. So I want to thank you all for coming and being part of this uh, collective effort to try to figure out how we're going to move forward. Just to start out, I just wanted to acknowledge some of the main themes that everybody uh, is going to be talking about today. And what I'm going to do is mention them, and then I want you to repeat them loudly <laughs> so that <clears throat> we all have in our minds the things that we're thinking about today. So one of them is local clean energy. Local clean energy. That doesn't sound like much energy. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot start this conference, you know, with a local clean energy. <laughs> All right, local clean energy. Local clean energy. That's right. Sustainable economy. Sustainable economy. Equitable development. Equitable development. Resilient communities. Energy democracy. Energy democracy. And community power. Community power. All right. What? Power. Power. That's it. Okay. So those are a lot of the underlying themes that we're talking about today. If it doesn't sound strictly like energy, it isn't strictly about energy. It's about all our lives in every respect, with energy being a crucial aspect of everything we do. So I'm Kirsten Schwind, I'm the director of Bay Localize, and we are very honored to be the host organization of the Local Clean Energy Alliance. Actually helped uh, co-found the Local Clean Energy Alliance five years ago. And when we founded it, there were just three organizations. Now there are 90 member organizations, maybe more, maybe it's up to 100, I haven't counted recently, but there's a lot. And uh, when we founded the Local Clean Energy Alliance, you, everyone in this room, is what we had in mind. So I'm really so glad that you're here today sharing this day with us. So I'm here to introduce our morning plenary of what's at stake and what's possible for our communities. And I want to say it is a very exciting time to be a clean energy organizer in California for three reasons. Uh, one of which is uh, not for necessarily a good reason, but for a very um, important reason, is that California is the new Saudi Arabia of the United States. We, it's a scary thought. We have, uh, with the innovations in fracking technology and all the oil that is now available that wasn't available before, there are 13 billion, let's see, uh, is it 13? Yeah, 13 billion barrels of oil now available under California free fracking in the Monterey Shale that goes between Monterey and uh, Los Angeles, basically. That's half of the oil in the United States. So that's actually more than Texas or Alaska. So we are the new Saudi Arabia, and we cannot afford to burn that oil if we want to protect our planet and our climate. So it is up to us, good people, to keep that oil in the ground. Um, so yeah, because we cannot afford to burn it. And also when you think about it, like fracking uses so much water. This is an arid part of the state and this is a part of the state where we need that water to grow food and we need to keep that water clean. So the first reason it's exciting to be an organizer now in California is we have a huge task um, to keep that oil in the ground because not we cannot afford to burn it. The second reason is that we are absolutely at the forefront of the clean energy solutions in California, and especially here in the Bay Area. And this conference is at the forefront of the forefront. We are absolutely the cutting edge right here. And we're gonna get learn so much today about all the great solutions um, and ways that you can, pl can plug in and make them happen. And I'm also so, um, a, what's the word? I'm, I'm really so incredibly amazed and inspired by the leadership 
um, in the clean energy movement that is coming from environmental justice communities and working class communities. And that's really what this panel is about um, this morning. Um, absolutely visionary leadership um, coming from the laborers union. Uh, David De La Torre is here with them, um, really bringing um, working class folks to, um, to the table to say, we unions want to support clean energy policy and we are going to be out there at the forefront doing that. Um, uh, from leadership coming from immigrant communities and we have uh, Mia Yoshitani um, here from uh, <laughs> uh, Asian Pacific Environmental Network which has been doing absolutely fabulous um, local advocacy and statewide advocacy on uh, clean energy. Um, and I'll do longer in introductions to all these folks. Uh, we have uh, uh, Gopal here from Movement Generation, which has been doing wonderful work on framing the climate crisis and making sure that people really know what this is about. And we have Annie Loya here um, from uh, Youth United for Community Action at East Palo Alto, uh, which is training youth to be deeply involved in land use policy and planning to make sure that communities that are most vulnerable to climate change are prepared and ready and and ready to go and um, to meet that threat. Because what's really at stake is that climate change is the world's biggest human rights violation ever. Because it was perpetrated by people with wealth and power, but the people who are gonna be feeling the most impacts are not those people. And so what's at stake here in the Bay Area is People with asthma will have more asthma attacks. What's at stake here in the Bay Area is that people may be losing their homes, that people may not be able to afford basics such as food, water, or housing. Um, there's so many more local impacts of climate change that elderly people, young people uh, may lose their lives during uh, heat waves or workers who have to work outside. Actually, every year California loses some farm workers due to uh, deaths during high heat, um, uh, heat waves. And so impacts here are real, and they impact people who have less wealth and less social privilege more. And so it's really no accident that these communities are at, are at the forefront of visionary leadership in the climate movement as well. So that's why it gives me such great pleasure to introduce this panel. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Gopal. De oh, Gopal, I've known you for years, and I still don't know how to pronounce your last name. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other Gopals in the room? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I should have asked Diana. you. Not, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it, Gopal and I actually went to the same high school together. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm going to say a little bit um, about Gopal before I bring him up. He is a collective member of the Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project which brings a strategic understanding of the ecological crisis and the transition to racial, economic, and environmental justice organizers. Gopal has also uh, been on the board or worked with a number of other organizations, including the Center for Story-Based Strategy, um, the Rucka Society, International Accountability Project, the Silicon to uh, Valley Toxics Coalition, and Project Underground, and is absolutely one of the smartest people I know. Please welcome Gopal. Thank you. I'm so excited there's another Gopal here today. And people are like, wow, that's such an unusual aim. That's like, no, no, it's actually not. We are, there's a whole lot of us on this planet. And many, many of us are named Gopal. So I was asked um, to open up the panel today with a little bit of um, framing of kind of the moment we're in and the, the crisis and, and in some ways what we see is kind of the central uh, responsibility or action before us. We all are engaged right now in a great transition. We don't know exactly where it's going to go. We all have an idea of where we want it to go. Um, and for us, a just transition, this idea that we can go from where we are to a better play, a better way forward is the political project of our time, to remake our relationships to place and to each other. Um, and so I want to start by making an observation, um, which is that um, from our perspective at Movement Generation, um, part of transition, a key piece of transition, is navigating the contradictions. Um, so it's important for us to have a really big vision and a clear sense of where we want to go. But getting there from here will be about navigating the challenging contradictions of living in the world we live in now. 
Um, and so as we, as I, as I sort of frame out um, what I consider to be some of the kind of the important principles or that we've been thinking about for what this transition should lead us to um, and what it should look like, I want to start by acknowledging that all of us are engaged in this work in a way that requires us to ask very hard questions about what do I do now given the resources at my disposal, given the community I live in, given the conditions of the folks that, um, that I care about, given my own conditions, these are, these are the contradictions we navigate, right? What I fear most is that we end up obsessing about the irrelevant contradictions like paper or plastic. And instead of engaging in the real struggle around contradictions, around race, around class, around power, around privilege, around control and ownership, those are the contradictions we should be struggling to figure out how to navigate well. Um, and so I want to start by both recognizing that, that the contradictions are real and they're all around us and we're all struggling to figure out the right way forward, given our, where we are. And it's important to prioritize which contradictions we're going to dive into head on and, and work on. So um, first, um, let me just say, um, I think we all agree, and Al really said this right at the beginning, this, um, if, if you think this is just about where we get our energy, you are wrong. It is about completely remaking the economy. And um, when we say power, we recognize that food is power, that water is power, that soil is power, that, from our perspective, the most important kind of power, work, labor, human work is power, that, um, that our culture is power, right? And so when we say we need clean power, we don't just mean we need low carbon intense energy. We mean we need to get the dirty out of everything. And when we, and what, so what's the dirty, right? The dirty is the corporate control, the lack of democracy, the, um, the, the, the legal and um, functional barriers to public participation in the decisions that affect people's daily lives. Um, so for us, clean is really about getting the dirty out. And in one key piece of that, it's about getting the dirty money out. Um, and so in some ways, I feel like we need to launder our energy system and launder power, meaning we need to decouple the money from the control, from the decisions, from the ownership, right? Um, so if that's what the dirty is, um, what's clean? So, um, and these are things that everybody probably already knows, um, but I want to um, lay, lay a few ideas out about what we consider to be uh, clean. Um, so first, it needs to be decentralized. And I want to make a clear distinction between decentralized and distributed. Um, I believe it should be distributed as well. But decentralized and distributed are not the same thing. Distributed is about generation, and decentralized is about ownership and control. So decentralized is about democratic ownership and control, and distributed is about generation. And those two things come together, and that's the sweet spot we're looking for. But let us not think that simply because we have distributed generation that we cannot still concentrate control, which is the way distributed is going if we do not intervene with public power, community-controlled power, those kinds of questions. So that's an important struggle for us around local clean energy, right? Um, so it's just, it's, uh, Decentralized. It's democratized. So you can also decentralize and have lots of private owners, but for it to be democratized, people need to be in control of the decisions that affect their daily lives. Again, we see the energy system as a key strategic point of intervention in remaking the whole of the economy. But let's not lose sight of, you know, let's keep our eyes on that prize, the bigger picture of the economy. So decentralized democratized, it needs to be diversified. Um, we are not going to solar solarize our way out of the climate crisis, or the economic crisis, or ecological erosion, or social injustice. It's an absolutely essential piece of navigating the transition, but we need to look at all of the different ways that we can get healthy, clean, democratized energy, that, and that part of that diversity is also reducing and redistributing our consumption of resources. 
right? Local clean energy can't just be about where it comes from. It also has to be about, obviously, who owns and controls it, but uh, not just where we get it, but what we use it for and how much of it we use, right? So part of our local clean energy vision has to be about rethinking how we actually apply the energy at our disposal towards the transition we want. Oh, that is my timer. <laughs> wow. OK, um, so I'll, I'll finish uh, in one second. So uh, decentralized, democratized, diversified, and as I mentioned, we need to reduce and redistribute how, um, wh what we use and how we use it. Um, and I will end there because I'm really excited to hear all my friends um, here talk about the very concrete things they're doing in their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gopal, for that great framing. Next, I'd like to welcome up uh, Mia Yoshitani, from, who is the Associate Director of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, more commonly known as APEN. And APEN is everywhere these days. I mean, fighting uh, toxics uh, from the Chevron refinery up in uh, Richmond to at the state level, making sure that uh, some of the money that's coming in from the cap and trade is actually going to the communities that most need it in, in California. They're fighting to make sure we can expand um, uh, solar installations in California. Um, and Mia is a complete organizing superstar. In her early 20s, she was the executive director of the largest student environmental network in the United States. Um, she was at the original, um, a, the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991, was on the drafting committee of those wonderful principles of environmental justice. Um, she uh, is uh, been serving for as uh, APEN's associate director for the past five years, and um, is absolutely a wonderful, smart person. And so, welcome, Mia. Thank you, and um, thank you, Gopal, for setting me up. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, it's, Good morning. Thank you. it's great to be in a room with so many allies and friends, and even family, and coworkers, colleagues. Um, and uh, fellow community members, fellow travelers. Um, so I always find it useful to start with my main point <laughs> so that in case I run out of time, which I'm sure I'm going to, that I don't forget to say really the most important thing about what I'm trying to say. So I'll just start with that so we can get that over with. So my main point is one that was even touched on by, by Gopal, of course, because he always has to say the things that I'm going to say first. <laughs> um, Low-income communities and communities of color in California have been paying this state's climate debt for decades, right? We've already been paying. By living in the neighborhoods most impacted by fossil fuel and the fossil fuel industry, with the worst and the most polluted air, the most polluted water, the most polluted soil, and paying the biggest economic price with the least economic benefit. So now, We've come to collect, come to collect on our climate debt and in the form of locally controlled, distributed, gener decentralized, <laughs> renew clean, renewable energy. And in the process, we're going to make the world a better place for all of you. So you're welcome. <laughs> so that's it. I can sit down now. <laughs> Um, my organization, APEN, and thank you for that nice introduction, we've been winning environmental justice and building power and leadership in low-income Asian Pacific Islander immigrant communities and refugee communities in the Bay Area for 20 years and more recently across the state. Um, we are a powerhouse. Uh, our first organizing project was in Richmond, California, and we still have an organizing project there in the Laotian refugee community. And when we first started that organizing project, it was because that community was being poisoned, like the rest of the Richmond residents, poisoned by industrial toxins, a toxic donut surrounding their neighborhoods. The biggest polluter by far was, and still is today, the Chevron oil refinery. Exactly. <laughs> and when I first joined APEN as a youth organizer back in 1996, um, to me, it was a classic case of environmental racism, a combination of poverty and pollution that's still part of the daily life of most Richmond residents and so many low-income communities of color 
and commu low-income communities across the state and country and world for that matter. What I didn't recognize back then um, was that these communities are on the front line of a global climate fight and that they have been for decades, literally facing down the fossil fuel industry in California. So we know that low-income communities and communities of color are already being hit first and being hit worse by the impacts of climate change and will be hit even harder by the rising cost of energy, of food, of water, and by the heat waves, by the rising tides, and by increasing fires and all the rest of the natural disasters that are that climate change is bringing in its wake. But frontline communities and the climate fight are also, frontline communities in the climate fight are also leading the way to reimagine the communities of the future. <coughs> How we can jam our foot in the door of this economic transition that Gopal was talking about. This transition that we all need, we know is going to happen, the transition away from fossil fuels. But how can we jam our foot in that door and crack it wide open to a just transition? One that is good for workers, one that's good for low-income communities, good for communities of color, and good for everyone. So you know, close your eyes for just a minute and think of those communities that we want to build in the future. When I see it, I see healthy, vibrant, cooperative, democratic communities where everyone has a livelihood, not just a job. And everyone has access to housing, to an education, to health care, to healthy food, clean, renewable energy. I see communities where you don't have to poison yourself or your family to work, where you don't have to sacrifice health for housing, and we don't have to destroy the planet to meet our needs. This vision is at the core of why good energy policy that benefits low-income communities of color is so critical for a just transition. And right now, we have an opportunity in our lifetime to disrupt this pattern that Gopal was talking about. To make the fundamental changes to our economy, and it starts by engaging local communities in fights that build new models for energy production and ownership. So like, like Gopal was saying, it's a, it's, a, it's a starting point, and it's an essential, central starting point that brings us a new imagined community and, and allows us to envision a new way of being. So we can produce all the clean, renewable energy that we need to live, work, and play right in our own neighborhoods. And that's what the, the Local Clean Energy Alliance is about. That's at the core of what APEN's policy work is about. It's fundamental to, to transitioning our community and to addressing the, uh, the, the roots of environmental justice that we've been fighting for the last 20 years. So we can create these local jobs. We can spend our money in the local economy for the things that we need and the things that we love. We can make our decisions about energy in our local communities. Energy policy is not just about pollution or even just about solving climate change, as Gopal was saying. <laughs> it's about self-determination and power. The new power economy is about power for people, power for the most impacted people, people who have been dragged along by the previous fossil fuel economy. So what we want to see is fully divesting our economy from fossil fuels, a just transition for workers that provides equal or better jobs. How about that? Better jobs than we have. That, that is part of the vision. Guaranteed full employment. An economy that works for all of us. Massive investment in local solutions, like the small scale, local renewable energy for everyone. We need public transportation, affordable housing, near jobs and transit, and I will stop. We need the livable, walkable cities that we can really see in our dreams, in this vision for our communities. We need healthcare and education. We need healthy kids and healthy families. We want to build a winning climate movement with the right energy solutions. We have to fight for what we really want, for the thriving, healthy, just communities that we can all picture in our hearts. We have to fight for real solutions that will bring dignity to working families, that will keep our kids healthy and safe, that will honor our cultures and our history, and that will put humanity and our ecology back into balance. Thank you.
That was beautiful. Thank you, Mia. And speaking of better jobs, uh, my it's my pleasure to introduce next uh, David De La Torre, who is the uh, Secretary Treasurer of the Labor's International Union of North America, Local 261, which is local in San Francisco, I believe. He joined the Labor's in 1991 and spent 12 years organizing in the field. Um, being a labor organizer is such a hugely important and difficult job, so uh, thank you for all that. And uh, I have to say that the Labor's have really uh, stepped up um, to support uh, clean uh, solar policy in San Francisco and especially to um, support uh, Clean Energy SF. So we really are thankful for um, your leadership in bringing labor along to support that work. Um, uh, David is also an alternative representative on the San Francisco Workforce Investment Board and he has served as a member of Mayor Ed Lee's 100% Renewable Energy Task Force. And um, he's been engaged in policy discussions designed to promote good paying jobs with benefits and career opportunities for economically disadvantaged communities and to build new partnerships between community groups, environmentalists, and organized labor, which are sorely needed. So thank you so much for that leadership. Welcome, David. My name is David Delatore. I'm with the Labor's Local 261. Um, LAYUNA is the acronym for Labor's International Union of North America. Um, we're international because we have members in both Canada and the uh, United States. Um, locally, uh, 261 represents San Mateo, San Francisco, and um, Marin counties. We are one of 11 locals affiliated with the District Council, which represents Northern California. Um, we also have a regional office and which re represents several states and so forth. So we'll start off with, uh, what's at stake? There's one before that. Yeah, what's at stake and what's possible for the Bay Area communities? Okay, now we may proceed, Eddie. <laughs> okay, who are the Labors? Founded in 1903 with over 500,000 members across North America and a history of progressive leadership a building trade union with members in every community working in construction on roads, buildings, utilities, schools, commercial buildings, and homes, as well as renewable energy, energy efficiency, and weatherization. Uh, LAYUNA stands for fairness for working people, regardless of color, gender, race, ethnicity, no matter our country or origin. Um, LAYUNA, uh, LAYUNA, Local 261, also supports uh, opportunities for communities, and uh, we were a big supporter of local, uh, the local higher ordinance in San Francisco. So, um, next, next slide. We believe in reshaping America's energy future. Um, we believe in a green economy that promotes not only jobs, but good paying jobs with benefits such as healthcare, retirement, training, and career development, particularly for economically disadvantaged communities and environmental justice neighborhoods. LAYUNA supports comprehensive climate change uh, legislation. Layers have helped build landmark renewable energy and energy, energy efficiency projects, such as the uh, Ivanpa, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Sunset Reservoir and the SFPUC building, and we strongly supported Prop 39. Um, and if you look, there's a couple examples of some of the projects that uh, um, our members worked on and helped build um, on the top. Your left, I guess, is the Sunset Energy, uh, Sunset Reservoir um, solar panel installment. At, at its time, at that time, it was the largest municipal uh, solar panel installation in, in the state. And um, we've, uh, our members installed uh, hundreds of those panels. Um, going clockwise, we have the SFPUC building, uh, which is a platinum lead building. Um, we've, we've uh, our members performed over one third of the uh, man hours on that project. Um, and to the left of that is the uh, Ivanpah um, uh, solar uh, thermal farm in Southern Cal, which our, our sister local 783, uh, um, our members also participated on. Um, we had over 300 um, members on that pr particular project with over 95% uh, community participation. So we were very proud of that. Um, and then on the bottom, you'll see uh, it was a rally in our sister local 304, which represents Alameda County. And I know some of my brothers are back there uh, 
so thank you for coming. Um, and uh, we, we support it. We had a big old rally. On the first slide, you'll actually see, see a, perm, uh, a bigger picture of uh, how many people actually. We had a great turnout. We had over 400 uh, members. Uh, we did a lit bomb in, uh, in Berkeley. And um, again, uh, Prop 39, as you well know, is the, uh, um, the bond for uh, energy efficiency funding uh, throughout the state. And um, if uh, there'll be extra credit later on if those of you can uh, point out the, uh, this afternoon's uh, keynote speaker. So um, next slide, please. Uh, there is much at stake for Bay Area working families. Building trade, union, building trade unions have tens of thousands of members in the Bay Area. Labor's Local 261 has 5,000 members in San Francisco, San Mateo, and Marin counties. And there will be more than 15,000 Latino members Bay Area-wide. Many members live in communities that will be, that will be most negative, negatively impacted by climate change. At the same time, many working families are still recovering from the recession, and to quote President Obama, may be concerned about the temperature of the planet, but it's probably not their number one concern. And if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the photo, you'll see everything highlighted in blue is what's uh, anticipated that will be, in that's anticipated that will be um, affected uh, due to climate change. And it's important to note that um, a lot of our, our members live in these uh, underserved communities. That's gonna be, um, that shows on the map that uh, will be affected by the climate change. Next slide. What's possible for Bay, Bay Area working families? It is critical to connect clean energy and greenhouse gas reduction initiatives with economic opportunity in order to build partnerships between environmentalists and building trade unions. It's about advocating not just for clean energy jobs, but advocating for good paying clean energy, energy jobs with benefits and access to apprenticeship. At the same time, building trade leaders must engage environmentalists to become fully uh, conversant about the realities of climate change in order to educate our membership. Both sets of uh, stakeholders can do better to collaborate. Again, the illustration there, that's the um, Portrayal Power Plant. Um, in this slide, you see uh, what I think is an important example of who environmentalists, community, and organized labor can work together. Uh, at the top of the right slide, you can see a picture of San Francisco's dirty power plant, uh, portrayal power plant. This is a uh, polluting power plant in San Francisco's southeast neighborhoods where the city has historically put its dirty power plants. It's closed now, but several years ago, there was an effort by some officials to shut down the portrayal plant uh, by building a new dirty power plant to replace it. The laborers were approached with a request to serve the construction of the, support the construction of a new power plant with an offer that it would be built by our members, all union. We brought this back to the membership uh, and what made it easy to say no was our ability to point to other clean energy projects that were willing to make the same type of commitments or at least to entertain the idea of working with local unions to develop these projects. You see, that's it, give it up. <laughs> You see, Save Go Solar, it's on there. Uh, that's the Sunset Reservoir project next to it. And then you see Clean Power SF, which is a program that we have supported for the past several years. Our members and our leadership rejected the offer to build the new power plant, and that's something that we are very uh, proud of. And uh, next slide. Oh, and in closing, uh, I'll stop. Uh, this is important, because this one here, um, it's, it's a rally in front of uh, City Hall, San Francisco City Hall on the steps of it. And um, it was on May Day, uh, International Workers' Day. And we were uh, proud and uh, glad to have uh, Sierra Club's um, support in it. So with that, I will close. Thank you. Annie started volunteering and organizing at the tender age of 13. Um, when she joined the Higher Learning Corps, uh, well, actually, that was 14. Um, and, uh, and then as a young organizer, led the uh, campaign to shut down a negligent toxic waste facility in East Palo Alto. Um, yeah, and so uh, she also uh, sat on the ad hoc committee, led to the structure for the, of the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing. 
and a number of other things. And um, she's also the chair of the Public Works and Transportation Commission in East Palo Alto. But I really am most impressed with the work of the organization she leads up, um, Youth United for Community Action. This is an organization that trains young people in East Palo Alto in how to get involved in planning processes and be leaders in their communities. And they're really taking a close look about at how East Palo Alto will be impacted by climate change, especially with the uh, flooding um, in that area, and uh, making sure that youth who are going to be most impacted through their lifetimes are at the, at the forefront of uh, finding those solutions for their communities. So please welcome Annie. Good morning. Thank you. My nerves hit me just now, so bear with me. Um, as Kirsten said, um, I'm from East Palo Alto, and most notably that our organization has been able to accomplish is shut down a toxic, uh, a negligent toxic waste facility by the name of Romic in 2007. And so it's important for us to note, thank you, um, it was a, it was a community-wide 20 year long campaign. And so when we think about change in our community, it does take time and we have to be able to weather the storm. Um, and it's important for me to note that for us um, to explore climate adaptation and clean energy, um, we were born out of the environmental justice movement. And I have to pay homage to our, our, our history and our beginning and our epicenter um, and note that there are still communities that are dealing with uh, polluting stationary, stationary sources, and that it's important for us to be inclusive um, of our communities and our struggles and our fight that we're not just talking about fracking, but we're still talking about agencies as well being accountable and, uh, to our community and uh, stationary sources as well being accountable to our communities. Um, and so what I wanted to talk a little bit about as we discuss solutions um, is local community versus government agency and the necessity in finding the happy medium. Is it possible? Wow. So our um, journey for climate adaptation began February 2nd, 1998, 15 years ago with El Nino. Um, in 1998, <laughs> I was in eighth grade. Um, and the cities of the peninsula reached a 45 year floodplain. Um, we were impacted East Palo Alto, uh, Palo Alto and Menlo Park. And this here is an image, um, there's very dense housing in East Palo Alto. And this is the image of the soft stories um, units being completely flooded. So those are garages underneath the first uh, story housing. I can use my uh, handy dandy laser pointer. Um, and people are actually it, those are people, those are heads that's in this water trying to pull out a car. Um, there's a video on YouTube that you can actually look yeah. at. What's interesting for us in the peninsula, um, as we discuss what's the happy medium, um, is that East Palo Alto is a city that's completely different than Menlo Park and Palo Alto. And I have to uh, clarify the myth that Paul, East Palo Alto is east of Palo Alto. East Palo Alto and Palo Alto are completely different cities and in different counties. And the demographics are completely different as well. In 2009, East Palo Alto median household income was about 40,000, population 30,000. In Palo Alto, the median um, household income is about $118,000, population 60,000. Uh, 60, so when we're talking about resources and access to resources and uh, race and, uh, and class, we're talking about two very set, distinct communities. Um, but flooding, however, water has no boundaries. And so both Palo Alto and East Palo Alto um, were severely impacted by the storm of El Nino. And because of that, East Palo Alto, Melna Park, and Palo Alto formed uh, the, joint, the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority to address flooding in our, in our cities. So, which brings us to the Newell uh, Road Bridge. Um, and, you know, even symbolically, bridges are supposed to unite us. Um, this bridge um, crosses the San Francisco Creek. So, you can see the bridge here. This bridge is 112 years old. It's when it was built, it's the primary mode of transportation was um, horse and buggy. So it's completely ops, um, inadequate for current modes of transportation, sometimes SUVs, right? We're, we've completely changed. Um, and so you can see here the structure of the bridge is sort of this square shaped. And the issue with this bridge is not only is it narrow, so only one car can pass at a time, and that gets us into transportation. That's a whole nother energy or 
climate issue we have to uh, consider. Um, but it also um, prevents water from flowing into the, to the, uh, under this bridge in the San Francisco Creek, which causes flooding. And this was actually one of the areas that were severely flooded in 1998 and even just last uh, winter. So as any public process, um, there were public hearings held in both East Palo Alto and Palo Alto about the correction of this bridge, to raise it, to bring it up to ADA standards so that two cars can pass, there's bike lanes, or sidewalks. Oh my gosh, that was fast. Um, and what was interesting that came out these public hearings was the undertone of race and class. The Palo Alto, and this is my, my point with these slides, is that, um, let me see, if the locals had their way, Palo Alto community residents, they would tear the bridge down completely, continuing to separate the communities. Um, and so if, and they have the resources, they quickly named it the super bridge. They, a lot of this community members fund their local newspapers that reaches the peninsula. And so, and there was an outpour of like, no, if we improve this bridge, there's gonna be an increase in crime. People are gonna hit our children. And um, it doesn't, if you wanna address flooding, just tear down the bridge. So when we talk about flood prevention, we also have to now consider race and class. Um, and when there's too much government, my next point, little can get done. So when we talk about flooding in East Paul, so there's a pump station where it's completely surrounded. Um, this is a pond. This is this area is the gardens of East Palo Alto. This is homes, residential homes. On this end over here is the sea level rise for the Bay Area to our to my up here, my left would be the sea level rise, to my right would be the San Francisco Creek. So we're completely surrounded by, surrounded by water. Um, and this pond that has no access to the sea has now been labeled the wetlands and waters of the US under the Army Corps. So when we think, and it's a habitat. So when we need to do maintenance that then stabilizes our pumps, to address flooding, we have to go to the federal and state government uh, to get permits, um, and which can take a very long time, if any of us know how long that takes, and thousands of dollars. So it now prohibits the city from being able to do active maintenance that will then um, prevent flooding or address the flooding issue in East Palo Alto. So when there's too much government, that can also be a deterrent to addressing these, these issues in our, in our communities. I'm trying to move here. So what's the happy medium? Now this is a, a very uh, local example um, in, in, in or respect to even cl uh, climate, um, is we're now working with the Red Cross, um, the East Palo Alto Police Department, the Mellon Park Fire District, and local faith based and CBOs to develop a communication plan for the city in the event of an emergency. What's unique about this is that we have all these experts. We have the, the, the intermediaries, we have the local government agencies, and we have communities bringing their own ec uh, expertise to the table to then be able to address and develop a plan, devise a plan that will meet the needs of the community. This communication plan will then be tied into the larger countywide communication plan and it's beneficial to the community because we have a place at the table. So when we think about public processes, community must be at the table. When we think, and we, that we also uh, understand that the necessity of other experts in the room. Um, and so as we think about moving forward and we think about inclusivity, as Gopal was mentioning, you've been um, referenced a lot today. That's the benefit of going first. Um, <laughs> um, it's not solely about fracking, clean energy, right? It's about stationary sources, which what our organization was birthed out of. Um, it's about protecting the most impacted communities. It's about public process and partnerships. Um, it's about developing the policies together. And even when we talk about challenging our own contradictions, our contradictions even within the room of energy and climate and environmental justice, that there's also some silos that we must break down in order to include and to be true to the values of the work that we want to be able to do um, so that we're able to move forward and really be able to address comprehensively the issues um, that are currently affecting us. Thank you.